Hi, I'm Jared Benz, an ISV Architect Evangelist with Microsoft. Today I'm going to be talking about creating skins for your WPF and Silverlight applications. Now when I use the term skinning, I'm talking about the ability to change the visual appearance and behavior of UI elements within your application. Now in order to understand skinning in WPF and Silverlight applications, there are four main things that you need to understand. Resources, templates, styles, and dictionaries. We'll be covering all four. The first concept we'll cover are resources. Resources are essentially reusable values. They can be values of any types. They can be colors, they can be gradients, they can even be more complex values like animations. Resources can be applied to a single element, like a rectangle or a grid, or they can be applied to everything that exists in a window or in an entire application. In this screenshot, we see a resource being used to supply the fill value for a rectangle. But let's jump over to Blend and see how this actually works. Here I am in Blend, and I'm going to go ahead and draw a rectangle on the screen. For this rectangle, we'll pick a fill value, and we will make it a shade of blue. Now you'll notice that if I copy and paste this rectangle, that the copy is also the same shade of blue. But if I change this color value, it only changes within the second rectangle. That's because each of these rectangles have specified their own fill color. But now let's delete this second rectangle, and on our first rectangle, we will use the advanced property menu here to convert this color to a resource. We'll call this resource Fill Dark. And I want to scope this resource to the application so that it's available to all windows. Now when I copy this rectangle again, you'll notice that this copy is also associated with the same resource. In fact, if I edit this resource by clicking it, you'll notice that changes that I make are applied to both rectangles. Now while we're here, I'm going to go ahead and give us a brightly colored stroke. And I'm going to also convert this to a resource that we'll use later in this sample. And with that, we've created some color resources that we'll come back to in a moment. Let's go back to our slides. Templates define all the child elements for a control. As you can see in the screenshot below, the default template for a button includes a special element called the Chrome and a content presenter which displays the text. Templates can be used for controls and even for data. We won't get into the data scenario today, but if you've done ASP.NET development, you might be familiar with a control called the repeater control. The concept here is similar, and WPF or Silverlight can repeat all the elements in a template for every data item that needs to be displayed on the screen. In this screencast, we'll focus on using templates to create a unique look for your controls. Let's take a look at editing the template for a button. I'm going to remove these rectangles, and in their place, I'll draw a button on the screen. By right-clicking on the button, I can choose Edit Template and Edit a Copy. The reason I must edit a copy here is because the definition of a button is defined as part of the .NET framework. That means that we can't edit the existing copy because it's compiled into the framework itself. In this case, we're going to edit a copy of the default button template. When we do this, we're creating a style for our own application. As before, Blend is asking us where we would like to store this style. I'm going to again store it in the application so that it's available on all screens. And I'm going to call this the rounded rect style. I'm going to choose apply to all, and I'll mention this again in a few moments. Now you notice that the UI has changed and we are editing the template for a button. In this case, I'd really like to create a plain looking button, 
a very flat looking button with rounded edges. So for that I'm going to delete the content that we have in here so far and I'm going to place a new grid inside of the template. Into this grid I'll now place a rectangle and I would like this rectangle to fill all the space available inside of this button. You'll notice the width and height are already set to auto and we're already set to stretch, which is good, but we do need to go ahead and reset our margin. And our rectangle now fills the screen. Remember that a button also needs a content presenter to display the contents of the button, so we'll go ahead and add that now. and I'll do that by just double clicking. For the content presenter I'd really like the, our content floating over the center of our rectangle. Uh, width and height are already set correctly but instead of being stretch and fill I would like the content to be centered and again we don't want a margin. Now I said I want my button flat but I don't quite want it that flat. So let me grab my rectangle, and with the rectangle selected, I get an adorner here that lets me adjust the roundedness of this rectangle. And I want this to be pretty dramatically rounded. Now this is a decent style, but I'd like to use the colors that I previously defined as resources. So with my rectangle selected, I can go up to Fill, and I can choose to apply a local resource. In this case, we will choose the fill dark that we created earlier. And for the stroke, we'll choose the other resource that we created, stroke light. And this rectangle has a very, very thin stroke by default, and I'd like it to be a little bit more pronounced, so we'll select that and we'll make it four. With that, I'm done editing my button template, so if, if I click this uh, return scope to window button here, I'll be back up to my window. Now if you recall when I created this template resource, Blend asked me if I wanted the template to apply to all. Because I chose apply to all, that means that whenever I create a new button, this template will automatically be applied. You'll notice that our colors are being applied, which is definitely what we wanted, but there's a problem here in that color properties associated with the buttons are being ignored. For example, there's no way for me to have this button be blue and this button be orange. The values are simply being ignored. Now remember that the template controls the visual appearance of the child elements inside of the button. In our case, a rounded rectangle. These color values here are being supplied on the parent element, the button itself. Luckily, templates are smart and templates are aware of the parent element that they live inside. So let's edit our template again. This time, instead of right-clicking on the button, I'm going to use this little drop-down here. Say Edit Template. And notice this time that we can say Edit Current. That's because we are editing our own resources and not trying to edit the resources defined in the .NET Framework. Edit Current takes us back to where we were before. And I'll select my rectangle. And let's look at our color properties. The Fill Value and Stroke Value have next to them a small green dot. The green dot means that they are associated with a resource. Remember that previously we chose local resource and fill dark for the fill. Instead of going directly to this resource, we've got the option of choosing a template binding. With template binding selected, you'll notice that we have four options. Background, border brush, foreground, and opacity mask. Those names may be familiar to you because they are color properties that are available on a button. Because we're editing a button template, Blend is giving us the option to honor the value that is supplied to the parent. In this case, we want to use the background. And in the case of the stroke, we should choose the border brush. And now, when I scope out of editing the template, You'll notice we have two buttons that have the same general appearance, but each of them have the ability to specify their own colors.
Unfortunately, what we've lost is our default values, meaning that if I draw a new button, the button no longer chooses our blue colors that we had defined as resources, and instead uses the colors defined for button background and button border brush. Since the template only defines the child elements of a control, there's no way for us to supply these new default values in the template. But that brings us to our third topic, styles. Styles supply the overall look for a lookless control. And in fact, all of the controls that ship with WPF and Silverlight are considered lookless controls. Lookless does not mean that the control doesn't have any appearance at all. It means that the control has a default appearance, but that that appearance can be changed entirely. Styles can optionally be applied automatically. In fact, when we chose the option to apply to all, Blend was actually setting an option on a style and not on the template itself. Styles, unlike templates, change properties of the parent and not of the children. And finally, since the template is simply a property, styles can be used to apply a template to a control. In this small XAML snippet, you'll notice that we've changed the default content for the button to be I'm a button, and we've changed the default background and border brush colors. In addition to simple property value changes like content and background color, we're able to set complex properties as well. For example, we're assigning a template here which produces the round green button you see on the right hand side. Now let's go back to Blend and use a style to set up our default colors. I'm first going to clean our screen up a little bit by deleting all these buttons. We'll create more of them in a moment. Now let's go to our Resources tab, and underneath the application app.xaml here, you'll notice that there is a style called Button Default. When we created our style and said that we wanted it applied to all, this is where that style ended up. We can click this button here to edit the style itself. Remember that this is different than editing the template, because we'll be editing values that apply to the parent and not the children. Now we're editing our style, and let me switch to the Properties tab here. Now, when I change these values, I'm changing the values of the parent. In other words, I'm changing the default values for the button itself, and not for the rectangle inside of the button. Here again, I'll use my local resources. And the same for the border brush. Notice that the names here match as well. I am changing button background and button border brush instead of rectangle fill and rectangle stroke. With this change in place, let's scope up and create some buttons. Notice now that each button we create uses our default colors, but we still have full flexibility to go in and change the colors of one particular button. So now let's see how we can take what we've learned and start building skins. The final topic we need to understand are dynamic and merged resources, and these are accomplished through dictionaries. Resources are stored in dictionaries. In fact, resources are really nothing but name-value pairs. We've been working with resources in app.xaml, which means that they're available throughout the application. But that's not the only place that resources can be defined. In fact, resources can be defined in many dictionaries, and then merged together as needed. In the diagram below, you'll see we have a resource dictionary for defining colors, and another dictionary for defining styles and templates. Those two can be combined in app.xaml to produce a round button that can be a wide range of colors.